well. Um, <clears throat> Jens, thanks very much. And uh, I think what he said is I'm getting old. And, uh, and I have been around a long time. So you don't have to uh, pick up a pen or write any notes from this lecture. This lecture is about, a, about uh, what I learned as, uh, in 2015 when I got a call and, uh, and we were uh, off uh, to Nepal. So I just want to share with, the, with you what we have here. This one goes forward. Yeah. So what I want to do is, that, um, is to go from here and just say, I wonder how many people here know what happens when there's a crisis. Because I had no idea, actually, what the chain of command is. Where does it all begin? How, who gets notified? So these are uh, general infections. Well, it turns out that if you have a problem in a country, you really have to get the permission of that country. That country has to ask for the help. So you, don't, you can't invade a country with a bunch of people and a dogs and, uh, and an and a OR supply and all that thing. So you have to have basically the Secretary of Interior, Secretary of Health and Welfare, a president of a country, and they have to really request this. Well, it turns out that in 1991, there was this, uh, the UN got involved in this. UN actually was formed 1948. And so what we have now is really an international system, and it's really a system. And then they modified it in 2005 and developed this cluster approach. And I'd like you to look at this picture carefully because there really are 11 different clusters. And a, uh, a cluster is really uh, going to be divided up, and you have to belong to a cluster. If you don't belong to a cluster, you can't enter the country because you are immediately eating and taking the food in that country. They don't want you there if you don't have a specific job. So you can't get on an airplane and show up and, and try to, uh, to go to work. It, it doesn't work that way. And I learned this. I've been around the, country, the world a lot, as Ian said, but I never was in an immediate crisis time. So this was what I learned. So look here, one of those might be shelter, okay? Well, if you're there for shelter, you need to have either tents or equipment. You've got to put people in and out of the rain. And in Nepal, this was the beginning of the monsoon sign. So we had a big team. So let me to go over quickly these clusters. So there are many people who work in international response, but you have to work within one of those clusters. You can go with multiple clusters, and my particular one on this particular trip was, was both health and I, we got into uh, emergency shelters, and, that, and uh, that's where we were. So we were pretty safe as a cluster to stay there. On the other hand, if you go with early recovery, what you're doing is going with dogs and trying to find people. You only have one week. At the end of a week, you have to leave the country. They don't want to feed your dogs. They don't want to feed you. And so you have to get them out of there. So it, it comes as a um, really shock to me how organized all this was. And so they have an Office of Coordination for Human Affairs, or OCHA, and that's a very important group because they're going to determine a lot how we're going to respond to all this. And these people work with these all sorts of humanitarian partners. And, and there's going to be a lot of uh, NHOs, you know, and, and uh, NGOs that are a part of uh, many, many countries that are going to be involved. I'm just going over a few of these names because they come up and they are UN-oriented. So Isaac is an interagency standing. These are the people that are going to really contact a Northwest recovery group or, an, or something of that sort. So here was Nepal in 2015. One of the questions I'm going to leave with you, is the mountain taller or is it shorter than it used to be? So as we go through this, I want you to think about that. Because April 5th, 12 o'clock, was the earthquake, most recent one. There were 21 people died on Everest. 
who were up at base camp with her, uh, and and um, but this this what happened was that um, I had been in Nepal three months before, so I got an email within the hour of the earthquake, and so I was able to fly directly to Dubai and directly into Nepal um, within about 36 hours. So. Getting through airports at that time is really interesting to watch how all these international visas and international stuff is happening. Remember, you can't get in the country. They don't want you unless you belong. And that's one of the things I want to stress here a little bit. So to learn a little bit of about uh, big plates that are shifting around, you can see where the red uh, uh, arrow is there. That is uh, really in Nepal. Now remember, there's a Eurasian plate. India was essentially out in the ocean, and it has migrated north and a little bit east. And as it migrated, it then came in collision with the Asian plate. And, it's, uh, and what happens then is that there's going to be three little countries up there. There's Nepal. Does this have the uh, dot on it? Yes, do I have a pointer? There's a red pointer right in front of you. It won't work. How does this one work? Just pull it up. It's small. Digital. Okay. <laughs> it's long. There you go. It's also used as a whipping stick. So what happens here is, I just want to point out, that this is Nepal, Bhutan, and this is a little bit of India, which is called Sikkim. And those are three countries that are all pushed up into this uh, area. And the... Um, and it becomes really important because this is a real simple diagram of what happened. Remember, is the mountain taller or is it shorter? That became the huge debate. So India is going underneath Asia. And then you have the Himalayas created here. I'll shorten the story for you so you know the answer. The answer in this case was that if this stayed intact, it was going to push this up. If this then broke right there, this hole is going to come down. So that was the, um, a bit of the debate about uh, a lot of scientists who were measuring this. It went down. You can no longer climb the old mountain. It's uh, about a foot and a half shorter. Uh, and so it's an interesting uh, part of this. Who's in Nepal and how big is it? Well, really, it's, uh, it's the size of Pennsylvania, if you think about that. And it's got 27 million people. So it's a highly a densely populated people. Basically, they speak a combination of Hindi and uh, Bengali. And so it's uh, basically an Indian extension. Um, the Indians love it because it's a buffer between China and themselves. And so there's a lot of politics that go on in that. But just to go over that again, this is their health thing. They do have a life expectancy that's 65. Infant mortality is high. It's about 39 in 1,000. And uh, it has a lot of places that are listed as hospitals, health clinics. But actually, they're very poor. And it's a very um, tough place to get a lot of treatment. There are 1,200 doctors. Most of the doctors in Nepal have been trained in many different nations. They, are very, they speak a lot of different languages. They'll be speaking German, Russian, and all sorts of things. They have a lot of Russian influence. Now, the next country is Bhutan. I only put it up because it's only a 14. Uh, <clears throat> it's about one third the size of Nepal and a population that's less than a million. And the next is Sikkim. And just so you know, Sikkim is still a part of India. And it's actually a very um, advanced place compared to Bhutan or, or uh, Nepal, with a high literacy rate, 82%, and it came there. So <clears throat> this is where the slip was. And this slip <clears throat> is, this is Kathmandu, the capital. Everest, Everest is up in here, in, in here right in here, and uh, this fault line ran, ran right through Kathmandu. This was the older <clears throat> uh, earthquake that occurred in 1934. And, uh, and so 
This is what it is. When we arrived, this is what we got. We got darkness. We got an apron of the airport. And this is where about 75 different international groups came. And uh, we arrived, <clears throat> and the only place you wanted to be was on the ground in a tent because the ground, the ground was still uh, rolling, and uh, we could feel the uh, earthquakes still coming, these after earthquakes. How, how long after the uh, index events did you arrive? About 38 hours. So it was, it was very close to the beginning of this. So this team, I had joined a group called Clarion, this was a firefighter from up in Everett who had organized this. He'd been in about 15 different crises. He was a, he's a terrific guy. It was called Clarion Global Response. This is an IMAT International Medical Assistant Group. They had been in Haiti. They had been in a lot of different places. So I was able to get in there. We had our own generators. We were basically self-contained for a period of about two and a half weeks. We had our own food, and that's part of the requirement to getting in with a cluster is that you are self-standing group that you can uh, supply yourself. Now, there's some very big fancy groups that come, and these are government related. So we had, uh, we had the British down here in the bottom. We had the Swiss up on top, fancy tents. This is uh, the Canadian group. There was, uh, again, the British and the Russian. And then this was an Israeli Joint Disaster Response Group. So there are people all over the world ready to go. Some of them are on salary, or they're in the government. They're in sort of like a military group or an extension of it. This is not people getting off the airplane and say, I got a shovel and I want to go to work. It, it doesn't work that way. That's what I really learned. Now here comes the Swedes. They brought all of their own motorcycles, dogs, and, and four-wheelers, these people are going to have one week or about eight days to land, and then they have to leave. But they came fully equipped, their own airplanes, their own the whole thing. So there are some very big internationally organized things. And going back to this, I just want you to look at it again, because we're going to have logistics, nutrition, protection, shelter, water, Camp uh, coordination, early recovery, education, and emergency food, and health. And health has a little name right underneath it, which is WHO. So w, the World Health Organization is really an arm of the United Nations. So that's how this uh, works. And so for everybody in this room, that's who we would be relating to. This guy becomes really important, Secretary of Interior. What he's got in front of him is what he needs, and he knows which areas have been hit, which areas need help, and you have to go through this person. He is going to tell you where you can go. He is going to make sure the helicopters and trucks and everything are going to happen. So this is the way they draw out the country. They mark it all. They know where the, the earthquake came. The earthquake came like this, a big old Persian rug. If you took a rug and did this. And what happened is it came across as a wave. And if you were standing at a node, you didn't move at all. But if you were in another place, your whole ground came up three and a half feet and then dropped out from underneath you. So the whole buildings came down. Everybody died inside the buildings. So, and then you go five kilometers on, and they'd be all protected. So it really depended on where you were with this wave. And many people have taken pictures of these earthquakes when they happen. It is this wave that comes across the country. So when we arrived, all of this was happening. Whole buildings, whole places, whole families. And all of a sudden, you had ch children that were lying in a basket out on the street, and nobody knew who they were, where they came from, or anything else. I was able to team up because I'd been there before. And you can see the general height of the Nepalese, and you can see the general height of us coming in from uh, North America. And the one on the right is, uh, is a general physician who runs in, you know, really emergency rooms, who's done about 10 of these uh, trips. And uh, so we showed up at this hospital. This is the teaching hospital in Kathmandu. It's equivalent to Harborview, uh, equivalent. 
They, uh, and when we got there, there were 250 patients on the campus of the small uh, uh, hospital, and they all needed essentially surgical care. So what happened was that the operating rooms opened up. There were eight operating rooms. They ran 24 hours a day, and we ran that continuously for almost 10 days. So the old-fashioned way is to get an x-ray and put it up against the window and read it, and that's what we did. There were many, many amputations. Open wounds were certainly the majority of the problem, and lower extremities and upper extremities were really, uh, probably took up 50% of our um, immediate, immediate things. So what you happen is somebody who's senior becomes a triage officer. That's how it works. So is the patient incompletely paralyzed? That's an emergency. If you're completely paralyzed, you go to the end. If you have an open wound, you come ahead. And remember, you only have so much time available in the operating room, and you only have so much equipment. And so the equipment here is very heavily based on the Russian system, and so they use the Elizarov pins, and that's how you stabilize so many fractures and things. Now there's some, and uh, these were fantastic doctors. Fantastic how hard these guys could work. The Nepalese do never, just never complain they have a smile that'll almost cut right through everything, and they were wonderful. Now, this is the kind of problem you have to decide. So, are, is Jens going to fix that hip, or is he not going to fix it? This is a common. We had six of these. And what happened is the whole building came down on them, so it's like a mining injury, and they drive the, the pelvis, they drive the hip right inside the pelvis. So, you can see that there were some marks right here. I tried to put pins in and see if we could pull this back, and we were unable to reduce those. So where do we put those on the priority? I had to put them way back because this one required time, blood, and long surgery. So these got postponed in this case for almost 10 days. I actually wasn't there when this was done later. And, uh, and this is a big reconstruction operation right now at Harborview. So um, you have to really think these out. And we had six of them, and they're in young people, one of them bilateral. And uh, so that's the kind of things. These were the wards. You know, the old-fashioned wards really work because as soon as a patient can talk and help someone else, they do. And so you have all your helpers are really the patients who are recovering, and they're helping to take care of the others. So as far as efficiency is concerned, the old-fashioned open ward is really a wonderful way to take care of patients. Uh, and doesn't leave you much privacy, and, but it is certainly uh, the way the world works. These guys were pretty tired, I'm telling you. We were working day and night for 10 days straight. This was right outside the hospital. We had lost one whole side of the wall. And then these are the funeral pyros where they, the dead were being um, burnt along the, uh, the river and then the ashes go to the river. So there was a real sad part of this uh, trip. But again, here were the Nepalese getting together and uh, marching, and this was within two weeks of the uh, time. Now, as far as the medical assistance group, I don't know if you can see that. This is a, these are a couple slides that were, uh, there's about 10 slides that were made by Robot, who is the head of this department, and uh, he sent them to me. And this is at the uh, teaching hospital. And he goes over quickly that this earthquake occurred just west of Kathmandu. And uh, this is <coughs> Pokhara, which is then a climbing area because Annapurna is right here, and Everest is here. Um, So uh, they said that if the number would have been 10 times this if it had occurred in the night or during the work day. This was, so it was the off work day when it happened. So there are 9,000 people died, 25,000 were injured, 200 missing, 500,000 homes collapsed. And, um, and these numbers don't, uh, probably should be pushed up a little bit, but I don't have anything to update that. This was where Gorka was the center of it. This was the town before, this is the town after. They lost everybody in their town. 
And we lost two young girls from uh, Madison Park here in Seattle who were hiking in that area. And I tried to go there and to investigate it, and the whole mountain, the whole side of the mountain was, was down. And uh, they did find the body recently. Anyway, buildings were just tipped over. The buildings are, um, are uh, some could stand after they were tilted uh, 20 or 30 degrees, but others just fell down. Here's the shrine. This is one of the great towers that's been existing for 300 years. It was sheared off right at the base. And uh, as I told you, you don't have to take notes today. I'm just going to show you pictures of the real life in uh, Kathmandu when I was there. And uh, again, big shrines. These are, you know, 150 feet up, and they're just all collapsed around. And <clears throat> this was the uh, the tragedy on uh, the ascent of uh, Mount of Mount Everest, and uh, these people were caught in a trap, and they killed a lot of the uh, the Nepalese climbers too. Um, this whole town was gone. You can see the whole mountain came down on top of them. So these were the disasters, but these were the way they were coming to the hospital as we were there. And he would find children like this child just lying in the, in the rubble. Sometimes they were alive and uh, what to do. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. These were rescues that occurred. There was limited helicopter transportation. And you become really aware of how much a helicopter can lift at a certain altitude. So we had really trouble getting helicopters that could lift tents and other things up uh, at the high altitudes. And the relief came from all different sources. And uh, the medical service started to work under uh, a lot of organizations that were there. I'm going to talk to that. This is the hospital before the tragedy. And now they had every bed outside. And for an acre and a half, we had just patients piled up with some of them blood pressure dropping and all. It was almost like an intensive care, out, an outdoor ten, intensive care unit. You know. And uh, so the hospital did what it was really, they had practiced for a disaster. I'm not sure that we've practiced. I'm not sure that we've ever put our shoulder to what has to be done. And I'm going to talk about it because we're sitting on exactly this situation. And so basically, you have to go around and code things. And you have to use those red, yellow, red and, and uh, yellow. And color coding is really important. You have to know who's dead. Because you've got all these people piled up. You've got to know that this one is not someone you want to revisit. And you have to quickly get that done. And. Uh, and so these were, these were just examples of the cases. And the strategy here was to get the patients out of there and into other small uh, facilities, medical facilities, so that we could use this place as a pure OR uh, operative place. And that's another thing. You have to shift your care emphasis and make the whole hospital whatever you need to do quickly. And uh, then you've got to get a lot of help from a lot of other people. So this is the outdoor ICU. And it took about two hours to get this operating room up because we didn't have the anesthesiologist right present. You have to really figure out who's going to be present for your crisis because they can't get there. So if we have a big earthquake here, where are our people at what time of the day? And you sort of have to project forward. Where are we going to get all the help to run the place? And who's in charge? And that's going to be a real thing. So here's just some figures. There were, in that particular time, when we reviewed there were 67 cases of spine. And you can see cervical, thoracic, thoracolumbar, and lumbar injuries. And uh, so. Many of the spine injuries, of course, never got to the hospital. They died in, the, in their uh, homes and, uh, and things. Mechanism injury was really they were trapped and vertical compression. Some of them was shearing and rotational things. Now, these slides were all put together by him. 
Here's a little bit where we the of those who got to the hospital alive, these were the Asia uh, numbers. And uh, so indications for surgery on priority were those at the top, traumatic autoquinine, spine injuries, incomplete. And then we had to get some sort of thing we were going to call a rehabilitation center. So that's another staging that you have to set up because you, otherwise you're totally constipated within the major uh, trauma unit. And uh, thing. I'm not sure that Harborview has really trained for this. Jens can probably talk a little bit about that. But we have not really thought this out. But you have a lot of injuries like this that were incomplete that really needed to be taken care of right away. Who, who did that surgery? Go back. Those are cervical pedicle screws. Who did that? Remarkable. Um, I did. Uh, <laughs> and Obami had been just there. Abumi. And Ibumi. And he, uh, he is really the founder of it. And so in Nepal, they are very up on that. So uh, we did. Go So lots of fractures. Today's uh, discussion is a little bit about that same kind of fracture right there. And things, equipment-wise, we are limited, and very limited. But it was amazing how we parsed it out. And, um, and uh, I was amazed. You can, you know, if you used to use six uh, pedicle screws, you can get away with uh, Sometimes four, sometimes three. And uh, sometimes you did things unilaterally uh, if you needed to do it. So these were, there's a complete injury and things. Rehabilitation phase was something we have to talk about. And here's some of the lessons learned. The hospital used a thing called HOPE, which is Hospital Preparedness and Emergency Program. And this should be adopted and they really had it intact. They had actually practiced it. Now, they had had a, a huge earthquake. They knew that they were sitting in an area that could be affected. And I was really impressed that they had practiced this to some extent. This was the back of the hospital where we lost a lot of stuff. But they, uh, they were very appreciative of the help that we did uh, offer when, uh, when all the international support came in. So this is uh, Nepal will rise. And they really had that spirit. They can, they are really tough. They can absorb an enormous amount of hurt and, uh, and come out. I think that, um, I think maybe the religion helps. This is the daughter of David Bishop, who was killed on, on Everest uh, many years ago. And he, his daughter came back and joined our team. And she introduced us to this woman. This is um, a woman who, for the last 25 years, went to all the border crossings into India and everywhere else and was saving the girls that were being exported for sex travel and sex exchange. And she built an orphanage, and her name is Mate, and she, she was the CNN Woman of the Year two years ago, and I was fortunate enough to meet her, so that was my picture taken of her, and uh, she was a, being a CNN hero, I think is the way they said it. So she had developed uh, a home for all of these children, and these people, uh, this was the most incredible little campus in the middle of Kathmandu. But she wanted to give $50,000 to take food to a northern part of Nepal where she was from. And we signed up to do it. Now, I thought this would be a fun, easy project. Turns out that when you have a starving country that's under crisis, taking food is not a safe project. It's a really interesting thing. So we had six trucks loaded with food. And we had to go on a military convoy. You had to have three people in the front. You had to have the whole thing set up. And you, and we traveled because as soon as this truck slowed down in any village, everyone was on top of that truck. And you were, and you were told you had to get from A to B. And there were a lot of little stops on the way. Even to get gas, even to get anything was a, a, was a problem. And so we mapped out where we had to go. 
uh, which is very close to where the uh, where the two uh, Seattle lights had died. And we're right up on the China border, so we're gaining a lot of altitude as we go up. This was our trip, and whole towns were destroyed on the way. You're going to get tired of watching all these pictures, but they are so real to me. And uh, this is the way we traveled. And so we had to sort of rebuild the road, moving rocks around to get it through. But the, uh, that, that whole slide had occurred across the mountain there. This is one truck that didn't make it, and it wasn't one of ours. But it, uh, the whole road had given way, and they went over. People were coming out of the woods looking for food and travel. People were in the truck, and it's hard to say no. And here were whole towns that were destroyed. But the most bucolic, beautiful little villages up in the mountains, it's just like Switzerland. There's no difference. These people live in a climate that is so forgiving. They were already had their first crop cut by late April. So this is, this is just India without the humidity, OK? And it's up at about uh, 4,000 feet, and Kathmandu is around 3,500. And then we were up close to seven where we were going in. This woman had lost her child and her husband, and all she wanted was a tent. And she came a long distance walking up to this where we were. This woman lost her husband. This was a food drop-off place. So we were here to give that food, and there was a lot of help. And uh, so this is basically rice. We had chain gangs to carry the food in. Meanwhile, everyone brought their, anyone who was sick to us. And, uh, and uh, this, this little boy had, was an orphan at this point. All towns were propped up. And this was five kilometers after uh, where everything was destroyed. <coughs> but here's the mountains. You couldn't have, you couldn't have seen a more beautiful scene. Uh, it was right out of Switzerland. And you're looking up at Annapurna up above there. We did get helicopters on the last day. The helicopter price drops immensely as the crisis uh, settles. And we could afford that. Now, this is the final part of this. This is the children. So the last project we had was an orphanage. Wow, orphanage is, plays a huge part in this crisis. Every 20 minutes, a child, dirty, hungry, crying, was at the gate. These 13-year-old girls who were in the orphanage would go and pick up that child. And I'm telling you, within 100 yards, that child would smile or laugh with a big hug from these young girls. And they had taken over the motherhood of these orphanages. And it was, uh, it was really out there. It rained when we were there. And these was uh, in the heart of uh, these kids. They had all been there. The woman who runs this orphanage became the CNN hero last year. But these kids give you a haunting look, I'm telling you. And. Uh, this was the woman who set this uh, orphanage up. And it uh, looks like the youngest Buddha and the next leader of the Dali. And these were two young girls. I'm telling you, they were 13, maybe, maybe post menarchal but maybe not. And they, but they had adopted all of these children. And uh, so everybody helps everybody. But these kids could dance with music, and uh, it was amazing to see the joy. So I'm going to make some, leave this final. If you live where there are beautiful lakes and mountains, you live on the top of an angry mantle in colliding plates. We're standing on one right now. So as you go through this, this is what it looks like in Seattle, Puget Sound. And we are pushing up the mountains. We are in a young mountain range. And this is not a matter of, uh, of uh, if, OK? So final thoughts. Crises are not a matter of ifs, but a continuous series of whens. <clears throat> and 
international response is very organized, disciplined by the UN. If you want to get into this adventure, you need to join an organization now because you can't go then. So that's the important part. So if you're really interested in all this, I think you, uh, you need to do that. Namaste says a lot, and it's uh, there. Thank you.